Chuck Missler. The subject of this tape, Genesis chapters 14 and 15. Uh, we are going to see tonight the first of several lessons in the book of Genesis where we're going to be conscious of the Holy Spirit by the use of his eraser. We're going to discover that there is designed in silences. There is omission that is not only useful, it's very intentional. One of these strange situations where if the Holy Spirit told you the whole story, he would fail to tell you the story. Well, got you curious now, right? I'll keep you awake at least to do the opening prayer. <laughs> right. And uh, this is one of the interesting ones tonight. There's a mind-blowing one coming up later. And uh, someday I should really do a book on the, whole, the, the eraser of the Holy Spirit. Those places in Scripture where the Holy Spirit intervened to prevent something to be written down um, because by its omission it is it serves God's intention in terms of his communication to you. There are many cases you can probably think of in your life where in trying to explain something to someone by leaving out a detail, it's clearer. It's close to that. So you often when you explain something complicated, a good teacher will often tell you something isn't quite true because you will understand it then, and he later takes care of the exception. Well, we're going to go even one step further where the Holy Spirit, if he included the detail, changes the meaning of what he's trying to communicate to you. So uh, so we'll have some fun with that tonight. And, and uh, now that Dr. Metherill is here, we can go ahead with the opening prayer. <laughs> Father, we just praise you this evening. We thank you, Father, for the the joy that you have given us to make it possible to be gathered here tonight to open your word and to be the beneficiaries of the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for this word. We thank you, Father, for your intervention in the course of history to bring us these truths. We would ask you, Father, to open our hearts and our understanding that we might behold those treasures which you've placed here for our learning and that in all these things, we might both behold and glorify Jesus Christ, of whom these things are written, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, we are in the book of Genesis, and we are... We got through chapter 13, and we digressed from 13, as I recall. Took a peek at 19, didn't we? Huh? Yeah. But for purposes of our just our pace through the book, I think I'm reasonably correct, despite our excursions and, and secondary discussions last time, that we finished chapter 13, essentially, right? Okay. We have uh, plunged into... A whole series of lessons and ideas and things on Abraham and Lot. And uh, we, t we developed those some last time. But by way of review and by way of summary of the relationship between Abraham and Lot, I commit to you a, a, an exercise that you might find useful as just an exercise. And it's more, it's more useful if you do it. Don't just copy my notes. So I'll give you a few ideas and I'll leave some out. So you can, you know, the ones that do it themselves will be more richly rewarded than those that are, you know, just sort of auditing the course not for credit. Right? I should warn you, there is a final exam. We don't, don't know the day nor the hour, but there is a final exam. <laughs> um, Abraham and Lot. Abraham walked by faith. Lot walked by sight. Okay? And that's interesting, not just in one episode, but all the way through. Therefore, we can, you know, we developed that idea that you can't backslide alone. When Abraham went to Egypt, he took Lot with him. On whom did it have the greater effect? Interesting, isn't it? Some of you in this room are very mature Christians, and from time to time you'll backslide. 
But you have the spiritual resources to call upon the Lord, confess your sin, and be restored into fellowship. What you'll never know are the weaker brethren that sort of tagged along and are still stuck out there in the mud. You can't backslide alone. It's a heavy, heavy idea. We talked about that last time, but just by way of, you know, moving a little bit from my flippant style into some spiritual depth here. Second thing, Abraham was generous and magnanimous, right? Lot was greedy and worldly. We're going to talk, you know, Lot, Lot was saved. We talked about that. We'll talk about more about that from what Pete St. Beard chapter 2 tells us. But certainly, they're contrasted there. We notice particularly Abraham's generosity when they split up. We talked about last time about how their herdsmen were starting to fight with one another and all that, and so they decided to split up. And as we watch that strife, we can't help but be intrigued. We, we can't help but take sides, right? Because what's Abraham's approach to the strife? Is to waive his rights. Hey, you take your pick. You want to go right, I'll go left. You go left, I'll go right. He's being generous. Right? I don't want to detract from Abraham's position. He obviously was being generous. But we can also look back and smile because of his knowledge of prophecy. Why could Abraham be so generous? Because he had the promise. He knew what he was going to get, right? I mean, you can just sort of, if you want to, put yourself on the sideline and say, Hey, Abraham, that's kind of an empty gesture to, you know, to let the other guy play first at the roulette wheel when you happen to know it's rigged, right? So is Abraham generous there? No less generous than you can be. Think about that. If, if indeed my tongue-in-cheek description of Abraham is valid, that he could, in fact, negotiate with Lot, saying, take whatever you like, somehow knowing from the Lord's promise that, hey, he's going to get the land, then you can say, well, gee, that's sort of a an empty gesture. You can make the same empty gesture every day with the world. You can be just as generous as Abraham was to Lot because you know that the end reward, the inheritance, is rigged in whose favor? Ours. So you can be generous. I'll, I'll leave that to you. Play with that one if it appeals to you. Uh, Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Lot chose a city built by a man that was destroyed by God. Interesting contrast. Poor deal. Most people take the second deal. Most people take the second deal. Hopefully, if we have any visibility in God's truth, some number of us in this room will be in the former category. Uh, Abraham, of course, was the father of all who believe. And we're going to understand that better after chapter 15. It's very interesting that Abraham's faith is pointed at, I mean, uh, in which chapter? Chapter 12, where he left where the Chaldees and went to Canaan? No. The famous expression that Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness does not speak of his leaving where the Chaldees. Was he a believer? Yes. But is that the faith that was counted for righteousness? Ooh, you mean justification. Right. His believing God, and in fact even obedience to God's call in chapter 12, is not what the scripture points to when it points to Abraham's justification, his, faith by, his justification by faith. That's heavy. Do you mean you can believe a lot of true things the Lord says and still not be justified? Yes. In one sense, that's what James talks about when he says the devils also believe and tremble. Are they saved? Are they believers? Hmm. We're suddenly in heavy, heavy stuff, aren't we? We suddenly got in over our heads. What's justification really mean? There are some things that you can believe and appropriate to yourself that have the specific effect of justifying you as righteous before the throne of God. And it isn't just anything God happens to tell you that's true. It's a very specific truth, and it's that very specific truth that is dealt with in chapter 15. 
Abraham's justification by faith occurs in 15, not 12, even though in chapter 12 he's a believer. Interesting. I didn't know the book of Genesis was really the book of Romans. Did you? Well, it is. well, Paul makes it that way because most of the book of Romans has one foot in Genesis as it goes through its issues, and we'll see that too. Okay, obviously Abraham, the book carries the story of Abraham forward, and Abraham is pictured as the heir of this world, of all things, right? Abraham's the heir. What's Lot? Well, all his possessions were destroyed in Sodom, and Lot shows up at the end of the story hiding in a cave. Okay? I'm always fascinated how certain people end up hiding in a cave. The kings under that were destroyed at the Battle of Beth Horon by Joshua in the climactic battle that finished the con- or you know completed in a sense the conquest of Canaan. The kings were hidden caves and said, "You know, rocks fall on us." We see another group of kings in Revelation saying, "Rocks fall on us, hide us from the face of the or the wrath of the Lamb," and so forth. Okay, um, we also talked about the the fall, if you will, of Lot, how he beheld. And then he chose, he separated himself from Abraham, chose, dwelt in the plain, pitched his tent towards Sodom, eventually not only dwells in Sodom, but becomes the city councilman, the alderman. He dwelt at the gate of Sodom. And, um, okay, one of the interesting things we'll see tonight, we're going to uh, recount the story of how these kings conquer Sodom and Gomorrah, take Lot captive, Abraham frees him, indulges in a, in a, in a raid, and frees Lot. And we're going to deal with that in a minute, but one of the things, let's not lose sight of, what does Lot do after he's been delivered? Goes right back to Sodom, doesn't he? Interesting. Interesting. Reminds me of a New Testament phrase about a dog and his vomit, doesn't it? I'm not sure it applies exactly because we're talking about something else, but it's, it certainly is reminiscent of that. Okay. Well, that's sort of by way of review of chapter 13 which is probably useful, if nothing else, because when we were in 13, we got into some of the other subjects. I think we wandered a bit. But uh, uh, at the end of chapter 13, uh, I'd like to start verse 14 of chapter... I mean, yeah, chapter 14 of verse... Th- uh, ch- verse 14 of chapter 13. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes. Interesting expression. Just as one of those things that you can do if you have set aside time to dig in the scripture, lifted up his eyes. How many times did Abraham lift up his eyes? And behold, there are three. And it's very interesting to discover that if you take those three, they, by many respects, are the three most important events in Abraham's life. And how curious it is that the very grammar, the choice of phrase, separates that that part of the text. Abraham lifted up his eyes three times. The first time, is here, where he lifted up his eyes, and what did he see? The land. And the key thrust of this passage and some subsequent passage is the commitment of the God of the universe to the land, to one Abraham. The second time we see him lift up his eyes. Second time is when he lifted up his eyes and Abraham saw three men approaching. And he's at the Oaks of Mamre. One is the Lord and there's two angels. Two angels have a, a particular mission to take care of in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord stays back to share prophecy with Abraham and enter into a very interesting haggle and negotiation. We may look at that ethnically and say they were haggling. You can look at it spiritually and recognize that Abraham was interceding in prayer. But that's a little ahead of us. That's in chapter 18. The third air time they lifted up his eyes is when he saw a ram that was to be substituted for the son. Substitutionary, which incidentally is the way Isaac is in effect uh, resurrected back to Abraham. But we'll get that in chapter 22. But it's very interesting that even the use of phrase, he lifted up his eyes, turns out to highlight the three peaks, if you will, in Abraham's chronicle here. Okay. It's also interesting that the Lord here said unto Abraham, comma, after Lot was separated from him. 
How interesting it is that the Holy Spirit instructs us that the separation between Lot and Abraham was a prerequisite condition for God for God's purpose. He asked Abraham to shed the baggage back in Ur of the Chaldees. They didn't do it. They all moved to Haran. When the father died, they moved on, but he still took Lot with him. It's interesting that the Lord used the strife among the herdsmen, or the strife between Abraham's servants and Lot's servants, as a means of separation. The Lord can use strife. That sounds strange to us, because we shouldn't strive. We always try to make peace, and that's appropriate. But it's also interesting that the Lord can use strife. Two ministers who've been working together a long time get into the most painful, sometimes childish, sometimes not, strife and bickering, and end up splitting up. And friends of both look at them and grieve for both because both sides are half true and half wrong. And they try to patch it up and it just doesn't get patched up because they're both acting less than they should. And we grieve, not realizing. That's what the Lord did in the New Testament. Right? You check Acts, that happens. Right? We can see it around us happens from time to time. It's interesting that the Lord will use strife. I'm not recommending that. as the, I, I, I'm not sure that that's the Lord's first choice. I suspect you might make a case that the Lord, that may be, you know, you know, um, third on a list of two or something in terms of what the Lord would prefer to do. But uh, uh, in any case, it is interesting that the Lord speaks to Abraham after Lot was separated. That is a call to separation if you haven't been listening. The Lord may be anxious to speak to you, but he won't until the separation he is seeking in your life takes place. That separation can be from a habit, it can be from a person, it can be from an environment, it can be from something else. And the environment that you need to be separated from may be an environment that he's perfectly comfortable to have another Christian in. So it's a very personal, special thing. The Holy Spirit has to lead you. But it could very well be. You can make a, that, you can, in fact, you make a good case from the Scripture. The Lord really won't reveal himself to you until there's that separation. And Abraham himself, the Lord, you know, approaches Abraham after Lot was separated. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land that thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. The dust of the earth. That's interesting. We have three different idioms for the seed of Abraham. The sand of the sea, the stars in heaven, and the dust of the earth. You can also discover that Paul in the New Testament describes all of humanity in three categories. Jews, Gentiles, and the church. And it's left as an exercise for the student to see if those idioms are consistently used. Is the sand of the seashore always Israel? Are the stars in heaven as Daniel used it? They that wind rain righteousness shall shine as the stars in heaven. Is that idiom used consistently? And is the dust of the earth, you know, the more general case, namely the Gentile dominion? Interesting idea. I don't know if there's that, uh, you know, that's something that you sort of have to play with yourself and decide whether it's an interesting thing or not. And uh, I'll let you run with it. Uh, we'll talk more about the three seeds of Abraham later, so I'm sort of just baiting you a little. Um, and, then, uh, and then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar for the Lord. It's very interesting that he's dwelling where? In Hebron. The Oaks of Mamre. Mamre means vision, right? It also can mean fatness, abundance. It can mean both. These roots are not that, you know, 2020, but that's valid. Hebron means communion. Communion. Joining together and, and also going to mean communion. Hebron. It's interesting that uh, as a benefit of this relationship, Abram is at Mamre, and we're going to see it's very important in chapter 18. Some very exciting things happen there. We also notice that he dwells in Hebron, the place of fellowship, as a result of his obedience, albeit the Lord had almost forced the obedience by the separation of Lot. But indeed, when, when Abram was in a state of obedience, we have the fellowship. Very interesting situation. In the conquest of Canaan, there were two faithful, right? Joshua and Caleb. 
right? Caleb is singled out in the conquest and so forth as the one that followed the Lord fully. We find that highlighted in Numbers 14, 24, but also in uh, Joshua 14, 14. And it's very interesting if you turn to Joshua 14, 14. Joshua 14, uh, chapter 13, verse 13, Joshua blessed him and said unto Caleb, son of Jephunneh, uh, Hebron, foreign and he. Hebron, for he's assigning places. Caleb gets Hebron. Hebron therefore became inheritance of Caleb, the son of Je- I can't pronounce it, Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Why did he get Hebron? Hebron was desired. Hebron was a reward. Why? Because he uniquely among the bunch fully followed the Lord. The others all compromised a little bit. They didn't really drive out all the, the bad guys. Caleb did the whole thing. And as a result, he gets Hebron. It's very interesting that the concept of dwelling in Hebron as a symbol of fully following the Lord is used by Abraham here and it's used of Joshua. Does that mean that everybody that dwells in Hebron is fully following the Lord? Heavens no. But it does mean the Holy Spirit is dealing with these idioms so as to form a, a level of communication uh, that may not be obvious except to the diligent student. Okay, that does bring us to the chapter 14 as we think of it, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Arioch, the king of Alassar, and Kedar Laomar, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and uh, Shinab, the king of Adma, and Shemimber, I guess, the king of, boy, Zeboim, and uh, the king of Bela, which is Zor. And all these joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedole Omer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. Um, now, uh, let's see. Well, maybe the thing to do is just let's let's finish the thrust of the passage and then come back and 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 see what we can glean from this. Um, verse five. In the fourteenth year came Kedor Laomer and the kings that were with him and smote Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim and Zutzim in Ham and Imim in Shave. Wow. <laughs> um, and so forth. <laughs> And the Horites uh, in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned, they came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that, that dwelt in uh, Haz Azan uh, Tamar. And there went out, and there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zaboim, and the king of Bela, the same is Zor, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim. And Gedeo Leomer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of the nations, and uh, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Elasar, four kings with five. Setting aside all the names, there's four guys that are the stronger ones, five that are rebelling against them. Okay? A couple of other things as we go here. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about the fruitless research that I went through trying to track this all down because you'll find the commentaries and the encyclopedias and the archaeological records are full of finds and details of word roots to try. You can, you can find out all kinds of interesting background about these characters, all of which it seems to have at least, let me put it this way, I personally haven't found any benefit from all of that yet. So rather than bore you to death, as is my usual style, I usually you know, at least impress you with all the background reading I've done by dumping stuff on you. And the truth of the matter is that uh, I either did it incompletely or it isn't really spiritually fruitful at that level. So uh, I, uh, I uh, in candor, pass that on to you. There are, however, some interesting things to be aware of. The alliance of four kings under Kedar or La- Laomar is our Shemites from Shem of the sons of Noah. The, other, the others are Hamites. 
and the Hamites are serving the Shemites, as you'll notice in here, which it is interesting because it is consistent with the prophecy of Noah. That's just a side comment. I don't think that's a central thrust to the discussion, but it's, uh, it is interesting. Um, also, you might be interested to know that Amraphel, by some authorities, is believed to be equivalent to Hammurabi. We know much about Hammurabi, one of the early Babylonian rulers, and uh, some scholars equate him with Amraphel of, of uh, Genesis 14. Others have elaborate arguments that they're not so sure. And it's not particularly an enlightening thing one way or the other because this is you know, very early in the biblical record and uh, I'm not sure that I can point to any real prophetic aspect of the name. I was hoping that maybe through the names of the tribes or something there'd be something of great significance and I have to admit that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit hasn't given me any insight. So what's nice about a large group like this, if I mention that candidly and tease you with that, then you'll all go back to your libraries and next Monday night Three or four of you have come up with new insights that I can add to my notes. But right now, I had come up right. Okay. Um, and verse 10 in the Vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, which incidentally is an interesting thing because that, that slime, the word slime pits is a clumsy translation. That's bitumen, which means there's probably oil in that area. So all of you, you know. And uh, uh, don't laugh. Uh, the uh, In uh, Mount Carmel, a, uh, a group based on the biblical reference, decided to spend over a million dollars of personal money, a few guys, to, to, to dig for oil on Mount Carmel. The government did give them permission. Everybody thought they are crazy. And we recently heard that they've struck oil. And, uh, and, uh, okay. Um, moving on. That's kind of exciting to find oil in Israel. How, how important to find it is is still unclear because it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not that simple. But it, it, they have, in fact, uh, found favorable forms of oil-bearing uh, deposits. Okay. Um, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. So in other words, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah are getting defeated here, and they took, and they, that is the, the alliance of the four kings from the north, um, took all their food supplies and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So basically what we have here is a military campaign of interest students of the scripture because of the first war mentioned in the scripture of the, these powerful four, the alliance of four from the north conquering the five from the south the, uh, and uh, succeeding in taking spoil. It impinges on our interest only because as a side issue, having captured Sodom and Gomorrah, they also took Lot and his possessions captive. And um, verse 13, And there came one that had escaped and told Abraham, the Hebrew. Here's the first place the word Hebrew appears in the scripture. It means one who's crossed over. First place the word Hebrew occurs. For he dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshgal, and the brother of Honor and the and these were confederate with Abraham uh, with Abraham. So he's made some local alliances himself, and he's gotten word that his nephew Lot over in Sodom has been taken captive as a, a as a byproduct of this uh, uh, conflict. Now this is an interesting verse to me. Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive. He armed his trained servants, born in his own house, three hundred and eighteen of them and pursued them unto Dan. Now, Dan is very far in the north. That's a long way. You know, we have to just pause here and think a minute. You know, we, got, we like to put Abraham up as a model of the man of God, right? And certainly he was. In spite of some of our emphasis, the fact that he wasn't purpose, he does blow it a few times, more than once, and we'll learn from that. Nevertheless, we certainly are in good company and when we point to Abraham as, as a man of God. We could easily say that Abraham is the most important character of the Old Testament, except uh, we're wrong. There's one other we're going to also stumble on here shortly. And the book of Hebrews tells us which one's the more important. Um, but certainly Abraham is up there. He's a, he's a big guy, strong guy, as an example, as a man of faith, right? It's very interesting that he maintained a trained army. That fascinates me. These guys weren't just, you know, volunteers. Hey, guys. 
you know, grab a rifle, let's go. They're trained servants. Trained in what? In battle. And <laughs> if you don't believe it, they succeed in a campaign against the alliance of four kings that wiped out these four kings to the south. So these guys are no rookies. Okay? They know what they're doing. And Abraham and his band succeed in freeing Lot later on. Right? So these guys are pretty swift. They're trained. I think it's fascinating to discover several things. Abraham's an interesting guy. Number one, he was prepared. He didn't say, "Gee, we've got to go get Lot. Let's uh, let's uh, start. Uh, you know, let's somebody write a manual and we start learning how to parry and thrust and whatever you know you do in those things." Right? He was ready. He said, "Okay, guys." I think that's interesting. I think you know, can a Christian be prepared for conflict? I think he ought to be. It may be his duty in certain cases. That exceeds the scope of our study, but I'll leave it with your thought because I'm sure it's an individual thing. But here's an interesting um, initial example. In the first war recorded in the scripture, we have a group of believers who, uh, with you know, righteously, I would suggest, um, take arms to retrieve their kin. There's probably a list of things that might make valid motives, but here's certainly one of them. Interesting, isn't it? Something else that has to strike your note is that he has 318 servants born under his roof. Interesting. Now, the born under his roof is an idiom, perhaps, of a certain thing. I'm, I'm not an expert in that culture to, to amplify that, but I uh, do understand that of all the servants, and there may have been thousands under Abraham, the ones that were deemed as born under his roof had special privilege. They, they had more freedom and more liberty, and they were they were an elite group. In fact, the eldest servant born under his own roof was his heir in the absence of the son. And we're going to see that later. This can be a very important person in many respects. His eldest servant. We think when we see that phrase later that the eldest servant is some kind of menial. Not so. The eldest servant is like, very close in, in concept to an adopted son, and the heir in the absence of a blood kin. He's going to have a very important role, actually, historically, in the life of Abraham. He also has a very important role typologically. We'll deal with that when we get later on in the, in the book of Genesis. But anyway, these are, these are um, servants born under his own roof, and they're trained to fight. And they, do, they acquit themselves quite honorably. They travel all the way to Don, and Don is in the north, and it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a place you could visit today. In fact, we did, and it was fun. Outpost up to the north. When we were there, the Israeli uh, soldiers also took the occasion to visit the nature preserve. It took us a while to realize that the coincidence of their arrival had nothing to do with their recreational outing. They were there for our protection because it's that far north. Um, but anyway, uh, verse 15, And he divided his men against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. That's quite a little traffic from Dan to Damascus. It's interesting. You know, those kinds of distances are relevant military distances today with tanks and artillery and what have you. These guys are on foot. He brought back all their goods and also brought again his brother Lot. Notice it's his brother Lot. I think that's interesting. It's actually his nephew. It's his brother's son, Lot. But for purposes of the text, the Holy Spirit allows the generic term, his brother Lot, which I think is interesting, especially as we try to understand Lot spiritually. And his goods, and the women also, and the people. In other words, they, he freed the booty. Okay. Now, okay. verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kader Laomer and the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. In other words, Abraham is returning from this victorious military coup. This was his entebbe, if you will. Okay? Uh, verse 18. <laughs> We now come to one of the most fascinating verses in the Bible. 
This verse will raise more questions than it answers. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be the Most High God, who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, that is Abraham, gave him tithes of all. Abraham gives this guy tithes. Here's a Gentile king who is acting as a priest, who knows the name of God in a way that has not appeared so far, but occurs four times in this passage. The most high God possessor of heaven and earth. This isn't the Israeli God of the covenant. This is the title here. It's the same person, of course, but I mean it's the title speaks to something quite differently. Now, we go on here, but that's all there is. That's all we know about this guy. And if that was all that we would find in the scripture, we would be tempted just to pass over this interesting figure who was there. And um, this is the only place he occurs other than a mention in Psalm 110. That's the only place he occurs in the Old Testament. And yet, I'm going to make the statement that this is the greatest character in the Old Testament. And I'm excluding Jesus Christ. I don't mean in terms of his Old Testament appearances. I'm, I'm, I'm taking for granted we're treating him differently. But setting that aside, here is this character. He's the greatest guy in the Old Testament. You think I'm wrong. The book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 7, says he was greater than Abraham. Why? Because Abraham's giving him tithes. So he is superior to Abraham. We don't even know his name. Melchizedek's not his name, it's his title. Isn't that interesting? Melchizedek, strange character that emerges here briefly and disappears from the record. That's all we know, what we've just read, these few verses. And that's it, as far as Melchizedek's concerned, in the Old Testament. It was useful, I think, if we stop here and turn to a commentary on the Old Testament that's in all of our possessions. And the book of, we'll turn to the book of Hebrews. And we'll pick it up, uh, let's probably, um, the end of chapter 6 of the book of Hebrews, and we'll take the early part of chapter 7 and take a look at what the writer to the book of Hebrews is telling us. Verse 20, it says, where the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, and the writer here speaking of Jesus Christ, but he says, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And if you're reading the New Testament at this point, you say, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, you wonder, what on earth is all that about? And the more biblical background you have, the more it puzzles you, because if you've done a little bit of homework in the Old Testament, you know that the priesthood is after the order of Aaron. Aaron was ordained as a priest. Aaron was of the tribe of Levi, right? And we know that in the tribal structure of Israel, as God ordained the structure, he declared Judah was the royal tribe, of which was the kingly line, the tribe of Judah. And Levi was the tribe of the priesthood. And he ordains that the priesthood and the king, the royal line, are never to be encroached one upon the other. The separation of the priesthood and the kingship was ordained early and endured throughout their history. In fact, when one intrudes upon the other, they get the wrist slapped, at least, or worse, because that was God's way. The priesthood was the priesthood, and the kingship was the kingship, and they were to be separated. There are only two exceptions, with a couple of footnotes. There's only two exceptions. Melchizedek is an exception. And he takes significance theologically because he shows up in the book of Genesis as a king and a priest. And the more you know about the Bible, the stranger that is looking back because he's unique. And the reason he becomes important biblically, or scholastically if I can put it that way, is because their most important king and the most important priest is, in fact, one and the same, Jesus Christ. 
And, in fact, the writer of the book of Hebrews, in trying to explain the significance of Jesus Christ and his preeminence above all things, points to him as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron. And the writer to the book of Hebrews is going to make the argument, which may sound strange to our mind, but makes a lot of sense to a rabbinical mind, in that the Aaronic priesthood, Aaron, came from Levi. And Levi was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. Therefore, Aaron is lower than Melchizedek, or Melchizedek is higher than Aaron. Because even Aaron, which the, the priesthood of Aaron, his, his tribal patriarch would be Levi, was unborn in the loins of Abraham, kneeling before the king and priest by the name of Melchizedek. And that may sound like a strange line of reasoning, but it isn't to the Jewish mind, and that's exactly what the writer of the Hebrews, the issue is going to, he's going to press here. Chapter 7, verse 1 of Hebrews. For this Melchizedek, Melchah means king. It's still used that way in some cultures. Malak is a, is a, a, a person name that still carries that idea. Okay? And uh, Zedek means righteousness. Melchizedek is king of righteousness. But he also has a title, king of Salem. Those are both titles. Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Now, first of all, right away there, we're kind of freaked out because here the New Testament is ordaining or ratifying or highlighting the fact that Melchizedek wasn't just some self-appointed character who, was, who had a thing going, receiving tithes. He was indeed the priest of the Most High God. It's very strange for us to visualize a Gentile priest of the Most High God. I'm saying Gentile sort of in quotes because he certainly isn't of the, <laughs> of the issue of Abraham, is he? Interesting. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. This is obviously a reference to the passage we just read from Genesis. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Tithe is a tenth. A tithe is not an offering. You know that. A tithe is what you owe the Lord. Your offering is after the tenth. You're going to be technical. I assume you all in this room are pretty schooled on that, but less than a tithe you're stealing. Look at Malachi you doubt what I'm saying. Uh, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness. That's the translation of the title, Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace, king of shalom. Salem, shalom being, you know, etymologically equivalent. Okay? Notice something else that's interesting here. He is, first of all, king of righteousness. Second of all, king of peace. That's not accidental. That order is always preserved in the scripture. And we'll, we'll chase that in a minute. It's always in that order. Righteousness first, then peace. You can't have peace without righteousness. We're going to look at that. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, this is often misunderstood. Some people from this passage assume that Melchizedek actually had no beginning and no ending. And I'm not here to say we know for sure that that view is incorrect, but it's, it's more widely held that, that what the, the, the writer here is making the case typologically. Melchizedek had no genealogy, no birth, nor death recorded. Did he have a birth and did he have a death? Probably. But from the point of view of the scripture, it's silent on that subject. And it's silent on that subject so that he becomes a type, a model of Jesus Christ. Because from a biblical point of view, we have no beginning, no ending recorded. So in a typological sense, or if I may, a rabbinical sense, he has no beginning, no ending as Jesus Christ indeed has no beginning and ending in that sense, and he, he reigns a priest and a king forever. Now the writer is going to go on to contrast this with Aaron. Now consider how, verse 4, how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham 
gave a tenth of the spoils. This guy's a pretty strong guy. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi. Now he's shifting to, to look at the priesthood as a normal Jew would think of it, namely a Levitical priesthood. They that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted with them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. You see what he's doing? The, Le the Levitical priesthood could never as aspire to something higher than the Abrahamic role, and the Abrahamic role was subject to the Melchizedek role. That's what he's arguing here. Verse 7, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. See, in a rabbinical sense, the writer is suggesting that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham, so he gets credit for it. There's a strange biblical idea that the children are, you know, uh, punished for the sins of the fathers. That the children carry the blessings. Of, you know, that, that, that idea is strange to us, but it's very clearly established in Scripture. Third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Mercy unto the thousands of them that love me. You know, you know the law. Verse 10, For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore, verse 11, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he who these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Interesting. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. You see the point the writer's making? It's a very obviously a very Jewish argument, a very Levitical argument. He's saying, here is Jesus Christ, because he's a royal he's, he's in the tribe of Judah. Yet he's our priest? Yes. He's establishing a priesthood far broader, far more important than the Levitical priesthood. There are two things wrong with the Levitical priesthood. One is that the Levitical priests were unclean personally. They had to give offerings for their own uncleanliness before they could officiate as priests. That had to be dealt with ceremonially, obviously. They would pick that up in verse 27. For such a high priest was fitting for us who was holy, holy defiled, separate from sinners, and made higher. He's in contrast, I'm, here's making a contrast on that point. The second point is that the Levitical priesthood was immortal. It had an ending. And the writer is making the argument that the priesthood of Melchizedek had no ending. Does that mean it went on forever? No. But biblically, it's not in view. In other words, from a biblical visibility point of view, we see no beginning, no ending. And it's being used as a model. Okay? Verse 15, And, it, and yet it is far, uh, and it is far, it is yet far more evident for after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. In other words, after the model or similarity or, or analogy of Melchizedek, there arises. Now, now, this incidentally is the verse that causes me to believe that Melchizedek wasn't literally Jesus Christ. There are some scholars that feel Melchizedek actually was Jesus Christ in an Old Testament appearance. He was there and Abraham came and, and he, was, he was in fact, in fact, one and the same. Some many good scholars hold that view, and it may be true. I personally don't think so. I think he's there only by type, if you will, or as a model. Because here in verse 15 it says, it was after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest. Who's the other priest? Jesus Christ. After the type or the model that Melchizedek represented. I don't think you know Jesus Christ is a model of himself in that sense. You want to follow what I'm saying? Who was made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. See, the concept of an endless life, what the argument here is that Melchizedek didn't have a visible ending in the scripture. So the, the, the writer is playing upon that in a Levitical sense. Verse 17, he testifies, Thou art a priest forever after the order 
of Melchizedek. And where is he quoting that from? Psalm, right, 110. For there is verily a, an annulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness of it. In other words, uh, this is an annulling of the Aaronic priesthood, which is there for a purpose, but not the purpose of our salvation, the purpose of our instruction, to set the stage for our understanding, but not by which we are saved. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw near unto God, inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this was an oath by him that he said unto him, The Lord swore and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And uh, then it goes on to make, you know, to dwell further. And I don't think we need to, you know, hammer this further tonight. But uh, the chapter goes on to point out that the Aaronic priesthood had weaknesses, and the the, the Jesus, the priesthood of Jesus Christ is superior to the Aaronic priesthood because it's after the order of Melchizedek. Very, very strange. Uh, very, very strange uh, uh, passage in many, in many, many ways. We might pick up verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. You couldn't say that of a Levitical priest. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for their own sins and then for other people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He's speaking of Jesus Christ, contrasting him and his role as our priest in contrast to the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. The law maketh men high priests who have an infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. In other words, not mortal. Okay, uh, getting back then. The king of Salem and the king of righteousness. I'd like to touch on that for a minute. It's interesting. Turn to Isaiah 32:17. Isaiah 32:17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Turn with me to Colossians 1.20. There's hundreds of verses, but this will give you the flavor of what I'm after. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. <clears throat> and having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. All things are reconciled to the Father, in earth or not just in the earth, in heaven also. Don't forget in Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Both are redeemed. But they're made, they're reconciled to the Father. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Which, is, which establishes its righteousness, right? And what does that result in? Having made peace through the blood. What happens first? The offering, which establishes the righteousness, then the peace. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. We're dealing here with the righteousness by faith of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, For all that have sinned, come short of the glory of God. We're being justified freely by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, right? Verse 26, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Okay? Just bear with me. Turn to Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Very interesting thing that you'll discover in the Scripture invariably. Righteousness is established first, then peace. Never the other way around. Romans 4, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have peace with God until you're justified. You cannot have peace with God until you're justified. 
How are you justified? Only one way. Only one way. Very bigoted, narrow idea. One way, Jesus Christ, by his blood. You can believe a lot of true things that the Lord tells you, but unless you believe that, you're in trouble. Okay? You can believe a lot of truth. Right? You can believe in the law of gravity. Is that true? Right? You know, things fall to it. You can illustrate the law of gravity, right? Dave Schaefer tells me that you can illustrate the, the uh, law of gravity by jumping out of a 10-story building. I would call that jumping to a conclusion, wouldn't you, Dave? <laughs> oh. That awful, yeah. So. Therefore, we're being justified by, by faith. We have peace with God. Romans 14, 17 will finish this little side trip. Even when we find a concatenation of neat things, like in 14, Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Notice the order. Notice the order. Righteousness, peace and joy. That isn't just a neat little concatenation of good things. Order is significant. Why am I dwelling on this? For two reasons. One is there is a basic, basic spiritual truth that you want to be sensitive to. And that is, you can't have peace until you have righteousness. You get righteousness by being justified through faith. That's the only way. Okay? Well, there's two ways you can be righteous. There's two ways. I should really correct. Walter Martin corrected me once. There are two ways you can get to heaven. And uh, one way, of course, is the easy way. That's to be justified by faith and so that we, uh, we have appropriated to us the Lord's righteousness. There is another way. That's plan A. The, the, the way I just mentioned is plan B. It's plan A. And that's that you are perfect. What you do is, when you're born <laughs> and you become the age of accountability, you never make a mistake. When you're tired and irritable and what have you, you never lose your temper. You never violate the laws of God in the slightest and you go all through life that way, never stumbling, never making a mistake, never offending God. And when you when you die and you go to heaven, you just walk up to the throne of grace and say, move over, now there's two of us. <laughs> that was... That story is probably heretical enough that I have no hesitancy to describe it to Walter Martin from whom I got it. <laughs> but it does illustrate the point is the perfection that it would take to get to the throne of God has to be flawless. And none of us qualify. None of us qualify. But one. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord, through faith in him, has allowed that righteousness to be appropriated to all of us. Okay. Um, a couple of other things. Getting back to the old gentleman. Let's, let's find our way back to Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> and uh, there's another thing. When Melchizedek is first introduced in verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth two very interesting things. I think this is awfully interesting since you know, we have no evidence that he had benefited the New Testament. He brought forth bread and wine. I think that's fascinating. You're going to discover bread and wine have very prominent roles in the book of Genesis. You're going to discover bread and wine is introduced here in a person who is by the Holy Spirit's design intended to be a personification or a type of Jesus Christ. And we have the elements of bread and wine. Bread speaks of the life, John 6.20. And he has come that we might have life more abundantly, John 10.10. 10, right? The bread of life, the manna, the bread of life. Okay. Wine speaks of joy. Psalm 104.15. And he has come, he says in John 15, 11, that our joy may be full. Bread and wine. Obviously instituted, and everybody's familiar with the, 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 institu the institution of these elements in the memorial of the Lord's Supper. What you'll also discover as we get the book of Genesis, that Joseph, who also is a type of Christ, is involved with two guys that have dreams, a baker and a wine steward. Isn't that interesting? And in three days, 
in three days, they're resolved. The bread is broken. He's hung. But the wine steward is the mechanism by which he is restored to life after three days. And it's interesting that the elements, as we get into Joseph, uh, we all try to remember to pass out a, a set of notes which will have over a hundred ways that Joseph is a type of Christ. Gentile bride, the whole thing. Okay. Um, before we leave Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, and here is a type, king of Salem, king of righteousness, here's a type of Christ. It, if he is a type of Christ, it should not surprise us that we have maybe an anti-type, or I should say more precisely, a type of an anti-Christ in the scripture. And we're fascinated when we study the book of Joshua. The Joshua, whose Greek name would have been Jesus, if he was Greek, if he was Jewish, was charged with leading the attack, leading the, the, uh, uh, his forces, the, leading his people to dispossess the usurpers from the land. And he's engaged in the battle that involved seven nations. And he leads this, the first, he takes a stronghold first by this, you know, the, 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 the Jericho thing. Jericho is a stronghold. And I think as I've mentioned to you, it's a fascinating study to discover that everything that Joshua did was against the law. He marched seven times. You're supposed to remember the Sabbath day. He didn't. He marched seven times. On the seventh day, in fact, he marched seven times. Levitic, the book of Leviticus says you're not supposed to let the Ark of Covenant go to war. It led the procession. The Levites were not supposed to go to war. They were ahead of the procession. And you can go on and on. There's just a long list of details. Everything he did was wrong. The night before, he ran into a guy in the evening that drew a sword, and he challenged a sentry, and he says, who are you? He says, I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Take off your shoes. You're on hallowed ground. And Joshua worships him, and the guy commands himself to be worshipped. Who is the guy we're talking about? Jesus Christ. He fought the battle of Jericho. End of Joshua 5, for those of you that haven't been into this before. But it's interesting that the whole book of Joshua is a model of the book of Revelation. Joshua starts by sending ahead two witnesses. We call them spies, but the real role was to see that Rahab was saved. Rahab the Gentile was saved. And then he attacks Jericho and he goes in. And it's interesting that yeah, just as in the book of Revelation, the pivotal battle in the book of Joshua is the battle of Beth Horon. And who's he fighting there? An alliance of kings led by one who calls himself Adonai Zedek. Adonai means Lord of, what does Zedek mean? Righteousness. This guy calls himself the Lord of Righteousness, and that's the one that is the primary final climactic battle in which Joshua wins the battle by signs and the sun and the moon and the stars. The sun be thou silent, the sun stood still, and the moon stood still in the valley of Agilon. The book three parts. And what do the kings do when they have to, and when they're routed? They hide in caves. In the mind of Revelation, rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath. Interesting model. The book of Joshua is an interesting model of the book of Revelation. It's also interesting that the Lord has taken the trouble to model some of these things in type. And we have Melchizedek, our king and priest, modeled here. We have Adonai Zedek, the leader of the alliance against God's people, taking the land in the book of Joshua. Interesting, interesting book with which we have to do this evening. The Most High God, same root we had noted before. Four times does it occur in this paragraph. It looks beyond all natural relationships. It's interesting that um, the priesthood of Aaron never transcended the limits of Israel. But this is the Most High God, who the possessor of the heaven and the earth. We find a title very similar to that in Daniel chapter 4. What makes Daniel chapter 4 interesting in the book of Daniel is a, a chapter written by a Gentile king. Daniel chapter 3 was the fiery furnace episode, as you recall. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the fiery furnace, and he, uh, Daniel's three friends are, are, are thrown into the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and sees there's four, that the Son of God is with them and has them come out and they get rewarded and it's a big deal and so forth, right? What you've got to realize is in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar wrote an edict that was written and posted throughout the known world. It's testimony time. And Nebuchadnezzar describes how God predicted that he would, through pride, fall, 
and when he did, that he would go seven years as a, a, uh, as a victim of a very strange mental disease where he thought he was a cow and actually eat grass. And sure enough, Nebuchadnezzar, after this prophecy, was walking on the walls of Babylon and was boasting on how he did all of this. And he was struck with this peculiar disease and relieved of the throne for seven years. And for seven years, he was in effect in, in, a, in a sanctuary, a sanctuary, a sanctuary. And um, then at the end of the seven years, he was cured of this, returned to the throne, and acknowledged that God of the universe... The God of Daniel was the God of the universe. And I read chapter 4 that he was saved. The guy that, by tradition, the guy that took care of him during those seven years was the guy by the name of Daniel. Very interesting chapter. But what's interesting is the title that Nebuchadnezzar uses of the God of Daniel. He's the possessor of the heaven and the earth, who makes kings of whom he will. Whom he will he puts down and whom he will he builds up. Very interesting. When we find this Shadowed here, in a sense, the God of the Most High God, the possessor of the heaven and the earth. Again, a very, very broad um, uh, concept. We find, um, we can also make references here of uh, Zechariah 6.13. Do you remember that when uh, Joshua the, pri the priest symbolically was crowned in the book of Zechariah? He was a priest crowned concept of a king and priest. It was just a, a ceremony the, that was introduced there, sort of a vision ceremony thing as a testimony. The concept of a king and a priest was there introduced. But because it is so unique and not literally a king or a priest, we know it points to Jesus Christ. If you're interested in that, you can get the Zechariah tapes in chapter 6 and uh, dig into that. And uh, we have a similar reference in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, and, uh, and uh, so forth. And in Isaiah 9, chapter, six, uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, when we're addressing Christmas cards, you'll come across Isaiah 9. For unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Interesting. Prince of Peace. A couple of last comments on, on, on the slaughter of the kings. It is interesting that there were four plus five, the Holy Spirit says, and if you add Abraham's force, that's ten. Is there significance to a force of ten? I don't know. I'll let you run with that. Um, it is interesting that Melchizedek shows up upon the return from the slaughter of the kings, which I think is interesting. And thus is it's described in Hebrews. If that's significant to you, you can run with that. Um, okay. A couple of interesting observations that I'll just leave with you to think about. I find Abraham an interesting guy. He has this army, and it doesn't seem that he involves himself at all in the morality of Sodom. I don't know if that's significant or not. What you think about that? It's interesting to me that um, he left them alone. He didn't impose his style on them, and vice versa. And I, I think that's awfully interesting. I, I think it's awfully interesting how Daniel in Babylon didn't require the Babylonians to change their diet to conform to his ordination. He simply sought permission from the captain of the guard that he and his three friends could eat a diet that conformed to their own beliefs, didn't impose that on other people. Very interesting, interesting concept of separation. Um, okay. Um, we, left, we left Abraham right in the middle of this thing. Verse 21, chapter 14, verse 21, after he gives the tithes to Melchizedek, verse 21, the king of Sodom and said, said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods uh, to thyself. In other words, you can keep the, the booty, the bounty, the, the, the spoils of this battle. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of the heaven and the earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. 
Now, Abraham is making reference here to the fact that he had previously sworn to the Lord that he would not take spoil, personally. And he's sticking by that. He doesn't want to be in a position that this king later on can say he contributed to Abraham's success. The only allowance that Abraham says, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men went with, with, that went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. He doesn't ascribe on them his standards. They were his co-inhabitors of the area. They joined him in this thing. They took spoils. Let them keep their thing. That's the style. That's the deal. That's the spoils of battle. I don't want any. Because he swore to the Lord in the first place, and there's a principle here he doesn't want to, 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 to allow the heathen to boast. Now, what's interesting is he gives up the booty, but there's a basic principle in Scripture that you might well take to heart, and that is the Lord will never allow himself to be your debtor. So he more than makes a, Abraham just declined to have the booty. What does God give Abraham instead? The whole land. Shortly in chapter 15, the big deal is the whole land. The whole land. I think that's neat. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, in that consolation comes a clue that we should not overlook. Abraham succeeded slaughtering in this battle, a major force of these five kings. Had he won the war? Not likely. A group of 318 armed servants succeeded indeed in a skirmish that was effective at freeing Lot and his possessions and returning them to Sodom and Gomorrah. Does that mean that it's all over? It's highly reasonable to assume that Abraham had offended the mob and he was nervous about it. Or, or I, would, I should say have cause to be. And I think we get that insight as we hear the Lord say to Abraham, first thing the Lord says to Abraham, fear not. That implies that Abraham had cause to be afraid. But the Lord said, don't be afraid. I am thy shield. Now I grant you that if you have the Lord's shield, you don't have a lot to be afraid of. No matter how many guys align with whomever. But he says something else that's kind of neat. He says, I am thy great reward. Where does Abraham get? The Lord. That's pretty exciting. Now it's interesting that verse 2 will sound like we've changed the subject. Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Now, you may, you may wonder, wait a minute, what, wait a minute, Abraham, weren't you listening? <coughs> the Lord said, hey, I'm, gonna, you're, I'm your exceeding reward. And Abraham sounds like he's changing the subject. Okay, Lord, well, what will you give me, seeing that I don't have any children? See, to you and I, it sounds like a change of subject, but it isn't. The Lord brought up the issue of inheritance, right? And the issue of inheritance is tied up with the issue of heirship or sonship okay and um, so it's interesting that as we talk about the great reward we hear Abraham talking about the fact he highlights to the Lord that he's childless and in fact in the absence of a child he is his his inheritance would go to his eldest servant who whose name happens to be Eliezer now we're going to find out later on in chapter 24 that Eliezer is going to go on an errand for Abraham. Two chapters earlier, Abraham will offer his son Isaac and Abraham will obviously be in the model or the type of the father, Isaac and the son, and the father's offering his only son. And we have a whole acting out of what happened at Calvary's cross. But a couple of chapters later, Eliezer sent on an errand to go get a bride for Isaac. Who is Eliezer a type of? The Holy Spirit. Just as Abraham is a type of the Father, Isaac a type of the Son, Eliezer turns out to be a type of the Holy Spirit. A couple of interesting things. The name never appears there. It always speaks of his eldest servant. The word Eliezer does not appear in chapter 24. The only way you know his name is Eliezer is to have done your homework and watch very carefully because here we're told what his name is. 
And that gets particularly interesting when you discover the word Eliezer means comforter. Isn't that neat? It's also interesting that the Gentile bride is always introduced to the type of the Lord in these models in the Old Testament by an unnamed servant. Rebecca is identified and brought into the story by Eliezer, but he's described as simply the eldest servant. And then in chapter 24, she's brought to Isaac and marries him and so forth. And we'll get to that, of course, when we develop that area. But the point is interesting, Eliezer is not named in there. He's an unnamed servant. We get to Ruth. And we all marvel at the book of Ruth, how Ruth, a Gentile, a Moabitess, is a type of the church. And Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, by an act of marriage, restores the land to Naomi, who's a type of Israel, out of Bethlehem, no less. And Ruth is a Gentile bride taken to wife by Boaz. Where, how did Ruth first meet Boaz? She's introduced to him by his eldest servant in the field. Isn't that interesting? And what's also interesting is, is that whenever the story is modeled around so as to cause this to be a type of the relationship of the church and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ, that in the scripture, the, the eldest servant's never named. Even in Genesis here, he's not named. Even though we know what his name is, he's not used in that portion of the story so that the type is perfect. Why? Because in John 14, Jesus Christ tells us something about the Holy Spirit. He will never testify of himself. Isn't that wild? Isn't that fascinating? That the Holy Spirit, spoken of in John 14, is the guy who wrote this. And even when he is in view as a type, and it's inescapably visible as a type. He doesn't wear an name tag. I think that's neat. Because he's complying to exactly what Jesus Christ highlighted in John 14. The comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He shall teach us all things. But he never bears witness of himself. The issue is Jesus Christ, not the Holy Spirit. But he's an interesting, interesting, exciting person of the Godhead. Verse 3, Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. You see, in other words, I don't have any seed, but one born under my roof is my heir. In other words, it's this earth. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own loins shall be thine heir. And he brought, forth, uh, he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, very interesting passage. Most of us read this passage. If you can count the stars, so shall your seed be. And we think it's the same kind of remark made earlier about the dust. If you number the dust, that, then you can number your descendants. It sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? Wrong. The word seed here is singular. And what the Lord is telling to Abraham, reckon, recount, recite the stars. That's your seed. That's who is your seed going to be. Am I making something up? Let's turn to Galatians 3. We covered this before, but I'm assuming that that little study we did on the Maseroth, the, what we call the Zodiac, is, uh, is uh, not necessarily familiar to everyone here listening. So uh, you might turn to Galatians. Galatians 3.16. Yeah, thank you. Galatians 3. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, not to seeds as of many, but as of one, to thy, and to thy seed, which is Christ. In other words, Paul is telling us, incidentally, he is referring to that chapter because he earlier makes reference, he's drawing from chapter 15 in this whole discussion of Galatians 3. If you read Galatians 3, you'll discover that. But his point here is, is that in that passage in Galatians 15, the word seed is singular, and it's not just an accident of language. Paul himself is making the argument that what God is talking about isn't 
Abraham's offspring in some generic sense, his offspring in a very specific sense, namely Jesus Christ. Okay? And the whole thrust of this argument is there. Now, those of you that have not weren't with us that evening when we went through the constellations, in terms of their pre Babel names, or at least as we can gather from what studies we've done, and the suggestion that the God's whole plan for the redemption of the universe is chronicled in the stars and was told to Abram, and he was to recount it. This is based on this in this passage. And you can get that tape and dig into that if that is of uh, interest to you. Um, verse 6, though, says, And he believed the Lord, and it, he counted it to him for righteousness. The fact that he believed the Lord in general, I don't think so. But is that he believed the Lord with respect to a specific thing. What? His seed. <coughs> Abraham was justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll prove that to you before we're through with the story of Abraham. When Abraham offered Isaac upon the hill, Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. Romans chapter 4 and Galatians 3, deal with this, and Hebrews 11, deal with the subject. And, uh, and, and it says, the scripture says that, Abraham, that the gospel was preached before unto Abraham. Abraham knew the gospel. He knew he was acting out the, offer, uh, the, 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 uh, the prophecy and the offering of Isaac. How do I know that? Because of the way he names the place when it's over. The Lord shall provide. Jehovah Jireh. And the Jireh Shalom, the Lord shall provide peace. Jireh Shalom is the, the word from which we get, the derivative from where we get uh, Jerusalem. And we'll get into that when we get, into, when we get to uh, Genesis 22. But the specific thing, the specific belief that justifies Abraham is his belief on the Son. It's his belief in Genesis 12, uh, to 15, not his belief in Genesis 12 that's relevant here. Okay, we can just clean up a few loose ends here. And, we, and, the, and he said unto him, I am the Lord God which brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give thee this and to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Okay. Three large animals, two small birds. Right? And he took unto him all these, divided them in the middle, and laid each piece one against the other, but the birds he divided not. The fowls came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, it just took a whole day, when a, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a, a horror, a great darkness, fell upon him. Now, no, let's finish the line that we're coming on. And, and uh, he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a sojourner in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, that is, these strangers at the drawing room, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. One of the conditions for them coming back is when the sin was complete of the Amorites for God to judge. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadamites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergesites and the Jebusites. We'll see more of those when we get to the book of Joshua. What is going on here? There was a tradition of making a promise, of taking an animal, splitting it by walking between, by the shedding of that blood, a, a covenant was committed. And that's sort of what's going on here. It's modeled after that. An example of that is in Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 18 and 19 and other places. In this particular case, though, it's a very strange kind of covenant because Abraham doesn't pass through. The Lord does. He has Abraham take a heifer of three years, a she-goat of three years, a ram of three years, all three of those in the book of Leviticus later obviously long afterwards. They're ordained to be typical of sacrifice. The heifer and the she-goat and the ram. The she-goat's the sin offering. The ram is a substitute for consecration. And the heifer also has to do with you know the cleansing. And uh, so uh, all of these speak of death. They are willing servants of man. And they speak of Jesus Christ. The book of Leviticus deals with these. 
How old were they? Three years. How long was the Lord's ministry? Three years. This is prophetically. Whether Abraham realized this or not, I can't tell. I suspect he had far more insight than we may give him credit for, because not all is recorded here. We just have a tracy of the thing. But we have a heifer of three years, she go to three years, and then also the turtle dove and pigeons, which are speak of heavenly animals. And these things are spoken of in the book of Leviticus. You can, if you're interested in this thing, you can you can use your study Bibles and dig into that on your own in the book of Leviticus. But what the Lord does here is he separates them in the theory that the two of them go through if they're making a covenant between them. Abraham doesn't. The Lord goes through. It's a unilateral covenant, unconditional. Is there something Abraham can do to break it? No. On whose faithfulness does it depend? On the Lord's. Now, how does the Lord go through? In the form of two interesting things. A smoking furnace, and from Jeremiah 11, verses 3 and 4, and other places, a smoking furnace speaks of the wrath of God. And a, a, a burning lamp. What does the burning lamp speak of? His light, his love, his word. 2 Samuel 22, verse 29, Psalm 119, verse 105, Isaiah 62, 1, for those that want to take the tape and chase some of those down. But you can do it with any good concordance. Um, now, another interesting thing is what kind of a sleep fell on Abraham? A deep sleep. Where did we find that phrase before? With Adam. What came out of Adam in the deep sleep? Eve. What is Eve a type of? The church. A deep sleep. Did Adam die? Was he born again? Maybe. Is Abraham, did he die and was he born again? Maybe. I'm speaking, you know, in a spiritual sense. A deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And I suspect the Holy Spirit would have you track back and take a look at the whole lesson that we went into with respect to Adam and Eve when Adam went into deep sleep and all of that. So you might, uh, if you're drawn, if the Lord, if the, you might be drawn to that. We also have uh, an interesting thing here. The covenant was for whose benefit? Abraham's. What did Abraham have to do with it? Nothing, except appropriate it. He's going to have to, you know, wherever he walks, that would be that would confirm it. It isn't his until he takes it. But does he do anything for it other than take it? No. The Lord provides the whole thing. We then have a prophecy the Lord gives him, and there's seven items here that they will be strangers in a land that isn't theirs, that they will serve those strangers, that they'll be afflicted 400 years. Now, incidentally, if you go to Exodus 6 and Exodus 12, you'll discover that they're actually in Egypt 430 years, but they're afflicted 400 years. And it's interesting, that's exactly what the Lord had predicted. And if you were Moses in Egypt, and you were a student of the book of Genesis, because you may not have written it then, um, you would have be aware of all of this, okay? Now, it also pointed out that God would judge this nation if they would serve, yet when they left, they would have great substance. And yet, while God says all of this, he also highlights to Abram that as far as Abraham personally is concerned, he's going he's to live to a good old age and die normally. He's not going to be part of that whole thing. Um, he also says, the seventh thing here, that they will return in the fourth generation. And if we turn to Exodus 6, verses 16 through 20, you'll discover that, that um, when they go to Egypt under Joseph and all of that, they go, Levi goes. The 12 tribes go, uh, the 12 sons of Jacob go to Egypt, right? Levi's among them. Levi has a son by the name of Kohath, who has a son by the name of Amram, and Amram has two sons, Moses and Aaron. How many generations? Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses, and Aaron. What generation came out? The fourth generation. Isn't that neat? Amazing. Okay. Um, we finished chapter 15. There's another study that I would suggest to you. It's always interesting. I'll leave you just a few little last loose ends. It's always interesting to discover the first mention of something interested in something in the book of Revelation, you always go to that place where that idiom is first used in the scripture and it'll un unravel itself. Now, um, you can take the first seven occasions of the word blood in the scripture and it'll give you the whole story of redemption. If you, and so forth. You can, very interesting idea. What's sometimes called by scholars the law of first mention. There are a number of things that are first mentioned in this chapter we haven't had time to go into. The word of the Lord came unto. First place it appears in the scripture. It occurs many times in the scripture 
This is the first time it appears. This is the first place the word vision appears in the scripture. This vision that Abraham has in this deep sleep as a result of the covenant. The word fear not occurs 180 times in the scriptures. It occurs first here. The Lord spoken of as a shield is mentioned here for the first time. His title is Adonai Yehovah. This is the first time he's here. The word believed, counted, and righteousness occur for the first time right here in chapter 15. So if those are interesting to you, they represent springboards from which you can launch on your own studies. And um, we will uh, uh, continue uh, next week then on, uh, on a study of chapter 16 as we get into uh, this whole business of the seed of Isaac, Ishmael, and uh, that contrast and what that means, um, climaxing our way to um, what to to some chapters coming up that are the most exciting in the scripture, I believe. So we we'll look forward to seeing you next Monday night. God bless you. This concludes the thirteenth study in the book of Genesis.